to turn this on. It, it sounds like it is on. Excellent. Uh, so good morning, and, and thanks for having me. I, I want to talk about, about trust. You know, when I'm thinking about you know, challenge A and challenge B and what we're trying to do here, fundamentally, we are talking about, about trust. Right? Challenge A, you know, can we build systems, IT systems, that we trust? And challenge B, which you'll see later, is basically, can we allow the authorities access in a way that we trust? So it's worth stepping back and asking, you know, what does it mean to say that we trust something? Or what, is, what does trust mean and how does it work? So you probably all know the, the Volkswagen story, which has made the news in the past week, that, that Volkswagen as a company designed the IT system in their diesel cars to basically cheat United States and, and European emission standards, that it would behave differently during a test. And, and that is an enormous failure of trust. And, and it's sort of an interesting one, because when we think about cars and emissions and the computer systems that control them, we actually have a certain threat model in mind. And the threat model we have is owners of cars tinking with the engine to get a better performance we have user attacks against the system. We didn't really think too much about vendor attacks, right? attacks on the system at the moment of inception. That Volkswagen itself would betray the trust in the whole system. And I think that's really interesting. And it's something we need to think about more as we think about high assurance systems, voting systems, or financial systems. And also, in the United States in the past week, uh, the president of a, uh, what's it, an applesauce company? It's a food company, was sentenced to tens of years in prison for knowingly selling food products laced with salmonella. I think like six people died. I mean, this actually was a, a reasonable sentence. But again, it is a betrayal of trust at the point of origin, not downstream which is where we normally think about it. So let me talk about trust in general. Right, so today, I woke up in a hotel room trusting the lock on the hotel room door, the building codes that the hotel was built under. I went to the hotel and had breakfast, trusting an enormous food service chain. I got down to the lobby in the morning, uh, went outside got into the car owned and operated by a complete stranger who drove me here for uh, the very reasonable sum of 10 euros, took that money out of, from me and no more, and, and let me come in, and here I am trusting all of you. And it was, it's not even 1030. The, the amount of trust that we, all, that we all have to do in our lives is extraordinary. Right? Trust is essential to human society. A and we as a species are very trusting. And we're all sitting here in this room, probably mostly strangers, and none of us are worried that the person next to us would jump up and attack us. Right? You laugh, but we are the only species on the planet that can do this. And if this was a room full of baboons or chimpanzees or, or, or any primate or mammal or any other animal, this would not happen. Right, a room full of unrelated individuals trusting each other to this degree. And that allows us to do so many things. Right? We trust thousands of times a day. Society will not function without it. And the fact that we don't even think about it is a measure of how well it works. And it's really important when we think about IT and systems. So, so I'm a security person, so I tend to look at this system of massive trust and, and try to figure out what's the security, what are the security mechanisms that make this work, that make taxi cabs work, that make restaurants work, that, are, that should have made Volkswagen emissions control software work and fail that will make our, our phones and our computers and law enforcement, all those things we're going to try to deal with, how do we make them work? Right? How do we build them? 
So I, I really think about how security enables trust. A and I think of it in game theory terms of group interest versus self-interest. Because really what I'm trying to think about here is how does the group enforce its interest? Well, group is very broadly defined and a little bit abstractly defined here. How does the group enforce its interest over the individual who might want to cheat, whether that, indi whether that individual is, is you know, the VW as a company, the NSA, someone trying to hack into your computer, but someone sitting in this room might want to you know, steal my computer and run out. How does society enforce its norms, basically, right, the rules by which we operate? And then how does technology affect this and how does technology change things? So, so trust is a really complicated word. It's very overloaded. There are a lot of different meanings. So there's a personal, intimate form of trust. Right? When I say that I trust a friend, it's not really about their actions and more about who they are as a person. Right? I'm sort of saying that I have a general reliance in them and how they will behave, that they will behave in some trustworthy manner, whatever that means. That's really what I'm saying. I, 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 like I'll trust their intentions, and I know their actions will be informed by their intentions. Now, that didn't happen in the taxi cab this morning. And when I say I trusted that cab driver, I didn't know him as a person. I don't know his name. I still don't. I never met him. I never will meet him again. I know nothing about his actions. And honestly, I didn't care about his actions. All I cared about, sorry, his intentions, all I cared about is that he would drive me here and not overcharge me. And that's a less intimate form of trust, more of a systemic trust. It's not that I know them as a person or know their motivations. It's simply that I can trust their future actions in some limited sphere, limited circumstance. Right? I mean, I don't know if he wants to steal. He might be a burglar by night, right? That might be his night job. I just knew, more or less, that he wouldn't do it to me this morning. And maybe that kind of trust is more confidence, and maybe the, the corresponding trustworthiness is more compliance. Or maybe I'm reducing trust to consistency or predictability. And when people are trustworthy in that way, to me, they're cooperative. Right? That taxi driver was cooperative in the protocol that he and I were engaging in this morning. It's a protocol that we didn't explicitly negotiate, but we both kind of knew. Right? He had a little light on the top of his car. Uh, I was waving my hand on the street. I mean, it, it, we kind of knew what was going on because it's a system that's well understood by, by both parties. But we were really negotiating that protocol, and we both had reasonable confidence. I mean, he was reasonably confident I wasn't going to pull a gun on him that we would get here, and then he would leave, and I would leave, and then everyone would be happy. Right, man, in today's society, we have to trust people, institutions, and systems. Right, I mean, I flew here yesterday, and, and, and I had to trust the pilot, right? Because he could have crashed the plane. But I really didn't trust the pilot. I, I trusted the airline that produced him, right? the system that puts pilots and cockpits on schedule and makes sure they're well rested and well trained. Right? There's some system there that's working. Right? And I trusted it without even thinking. It's not that I trusted the taxi driver, but I trusted the system that produced him. You know, without even knowing it, whatever the, the, the codes are in this city. I mean, I remember being in uh, Forget which uh, which Eastern European city. And there were two kinds of taxis. There were black ones and pink ones. And I was warned not to take those, but to take these. These are more trustworthy. Right? There was this whole system I didn't know, but but someone had to tell me. But here, you know, I didn't worry about that. Now, also this morning, actually, I, I pulled money out of an ATM machine. A very interesting uh, expression of trust because it all happened in French. Right, and I trusted that this machine would give me cash and then deduct the proper amount from my account back home with only a slight usurious fee and not a crazy usurious fee. But again, I did that really without a lot of thinking. 
And so what's going on here? It's, it's, it's sort of interesting. And trust is very fluid and very multidimensional. Right? So I might trust Alice to return a $10 loan but not a $10,000 loan. And I might trust Bob to return a $10,000 loan but not to babysit an infant. And I can trust Carol to babysit the infant but not with my house key. And I might trust Dave with my house key but not with a $10 loan. Right? It's, it's, it's very circumstantial when we say we trust. I mean, we've heard a lot about trusting hardware, trusting software, but it's, it's always, it's always going to be, when you get down to it, in what context, in what circumstance, to do what, in, you know, the trust is embedded in a bigger system. All right, so, so all complex ecosystems require cooperation. And this is true for biological systems, for social systems, and for socio-technical systems. And those are the ones that, that we really care about. But in any cooperative system, there also exists an alternative parasitic strategy. Right? In a system where we all trust, trust taxi cab drivers, a malicious taxi cab driver can do well. Right? Because he's going to be able to prey on the fact that we trust them. Someone puts up a fake ATM machine, I'm going to use it not knowing. Because I generally trust ATM machines. Right? And so you can think of tapeworms in a digestive tract, or thieves in a market, or spammers in email, or people who don't pay their taxes. Right? These are all parasites on the trusted system. And, and in the, sort of the game theory way, the, they're, they're defectors. And, and once you use this terminology, it's very clear we can uh, employ the prisoner's dilemma and really look at this notion of cooperators versus defectors and how defectors can do better in their strategy. But defectors are only successful if they're not, they can only survive if they're not too successful. Right? The number of defectors gets too large, the system collapses. Right? So if the tapeworms get too greedy, you know, we all die and they die. Too many people steal in a market, the market closes. There's too much spam, no one reads their email. And if, you know, enough people don't pay their taxes, you get grease. Right? So it's what society has to do is deal with this fundamental tension between us as individuals and us as society. There's a lot written about this evolutionarily, how we are trying to compete individually and also cooperate collectively. Right? So, you know, we might be better off if, if I, I might be better off if I can steal your stuff, but we're all better off if no one steals. But if really, if you think about it, I'm better off if I live in a society where no one steals and I steal your stuff, right? Because I get the benefits of a theft-free society and I also get your stuff, right? And that's, the, that's sort of the problem we're dealing with. And the NSA wants to live in a world where there's lots of secure systems and they are the ones who get to break them and no one else does. But that's the wrong way to think. Because if everyone thinks like that, everyone breaks the security and no one has security. But those are exceptions. Right? Most of us realize this. Most of us realize that it's not in our short-term self-interest, our long-term best interest to act in our short-term self-interest. And most of us realize that we're going to be all better off if we don't attack each other in this way, even if we might get immediate advantage from it. And most people don't cheat on their taxes. Most companies don't hack their own emissions control software. Right? Those are exceptions. Because right? if it wasn't an exception, society would collapse. Right, this would be Hobbes all against all, and, and nothing would work. Right, most of us are cooperative most of the time. Like, almost all of us are cooperative almost all of the time. So security becomes a tax. Right? Security is a mechanism for dealing with a dishonest minority. It was uh, the American James Madison who called security what did he say? He said, if all men were angels, no government would be necessary. 
what he's saying is if everyone just followed the norms, you wouldn't need anybody imposing rules on top of us. And so security becomes a tax on the honest. So, so this is how it works. Right? Security induces cooperation. Cooperation induces trustworthiness. Trustworthiness enables us to, uh, to make trust work, and that keeps society functioning. So that's the mechanism we're looking at. And there are four basic ways we do this. And they all have analogs in, in the computer world. The first one is morals. Evolutionary, a lot of us do the right thing because it feels good. Huge amount of literature on this. Right? It bothers people when they cheat and lie. It makes people feel good when they cooperate, when they help. It's not, it, it's not perfect, but that is the underpinning of all of this. That we as individuals, we as a species, want to behave properly. And this is like feelings of guilt and shame, uh, senses of fairness, senses of altruism, desires to be honest, deferences to authority. I mean, all of these are baked into our genes. Right? It's a combination of innate and cultural factors, very robust. The second, which is, which is equally robust, is the notion of reputation. Right? We behave well because why we want to be thought of as well. And in our, in our evolutionary past, we would induce cooperation by chastising those among us who would defect. In extreme cases, expelling them from the group. And we are enormously sensitive to reputation as an individuals and as species. Right? And we know this. If someone I'm invited to my house and he steals my sweater, I'm not going to call the police. I'm going to not invite him over anymore. Like he's the guy who stole my sweater. Right? And, and, and that works. Those two, those two techniques are very old, as old as our species. And you can actually see them in other primate species in operation. But the problem is that they're, they're not good enough. The problem is they don't scale. Right? They work at human numbers. And when, you, when we use the term norms, and you hear that a lot talking about behavior in cyberspace, the lack of norms, these are norms. Norms have trouble scaling. There are a lot of reasons why that's so, so to leave that aside. But as we get bigger, as we get more technical, we need more complicated ways of inducing cooperation. And the first one we figure out is institutions. You know, whether you call those laws or, or you know, depending on society, different ways it works. But institutional mechanisms to ensure people cooperate. Right? Laws play a big part in our society. And that's, and, and of course, it's laws and the enforcement of those laws. Right? The fact that the, the, the VW is going to have a ginormous fine hopefully will convince others not to. The fact that the, the president of that food company is actually going to jail for tens of years sends a huge signal to others. And we can argue whether it's good enough, whether we have to tweak it, but that's the basic mechanism. That's, that's how laws deter. And the last thing are, are, of course, the technologies. The technologies live on top of all of this. And there's lots of security technologies that induce cooperation or prevent defection or induce trust or compel compliance. And you could think about any, any tech system and look at the security measures and sort of see where they fit in there. So it's door locks and tall fences or alarm systems and guards, forensic and audit systems, mitigation recovery systems. Right? And, and they all work together. So think about stealing. Most of us don't steal because we know it's wrong. Some of us don't steal because what would our friends think? Right? Some of us don't steal because we'll go to jail if we do. And, and you know, very few of us up here don't steal because we can't pick the door lock. But that door lock is just an extremely tiny slice of the whole mechanisms that make sure that you know, most of us haven't anything stolen from us in a whole bunch of years, which is really kind of extraordinary. Right, so how do we do this in, in tech systems? Well, we kind of know the answer, right? You know, transparency, oversight, accountability. When we have those things, the mechanisms kind of work. You know, when they fail, this is how Volkswagen got away with it for, with it for like six years. 
because there wasn't the transparency. You know, now that the thing is public, we're hoping the oversight mechanisms work. We're hoping there is accountability. You know, if there isn't, that will send a very bad signal. You know, when you think about the NSA and hacking into systems or looking at hardware, right, the problems go, the problems are going to be the lack of transparency, not being able to see what happens, the lack of oversight, the lack of accountability. I mean, those are going to be are, are going to be the issues. Right? And, and you sort of have this, this arms race here between those of us who want to make the trust work and those of us who want to defect. And then our arms race is going to be affected by technology. Technology will change balances. Sometimes in favor of the attacker, sometimes in favor of the defender. But attackers tend to have advantages. I mean, basic first mover advantages, basic uh, fact that they can often more agile. I think a criminal is going to be much more agile than a defender. Less bureaucracy. And this makes this a, sort of a difficult game. And I always think of this in terms of a security gap. Right, this, this time delay between when the attackers figure out new ways to attack systems and when defenders can, can figure out how to plug those holes. And we're sort of seeing that gap right now. And there was an enormous advantage in surveillance because, because it was all hidden. And now that we're seeing it, we're trying to recover. This, this, this event is an example of that. But it's going to be a multi-year process. And in that time, the attackers are going to figure out more things to do in secret. So you know, it's hard to know who wins here. So when I look at I mean, the, the basic challenges we have of building, building high assurance systems, building systems that are trustworthy, in which we have to trust as few things as possible to know they're trustworthy, I don't see a lot of options that don't involve transparency, oversight, and accountability. We're going to have to trust hundreds and thousands of entities and systems and processes. There's going to be no way around that. Because so much of our assurance, our security, is based on a chain where the weakest link breaks it. So I need to see transparency. I need to see oversight. I need to see accountability. I, I need to see norms. I mean, U.S. and China have this big uh, summit right now, or, or is it next week, where there's going to be maybe some kind of, of cyber treaty. It's not going to mean anything because we just don't have the norms in cyberspace as to what, is the pro what are the proper actions. Or the norms we have are so lax that anything goes. I mean, without that, without those morals and... Uh, and ethics and reputation, you're not going to be able to build the laws and then technology on top of that. I mean, look at Bitcoin. I'll sort of end with this. Bitcoin's a great example of a system that tried to pull as much trust out of the financial system as possible. Yet Bitcoin is hacked all the time. Exchanges are hacked, wallets are hacked, computers are hacked. The math is fine, but the, the ecosystem requires, still requires an enormous amount of trust. And making that work turns out to be really, really hard. And we thought it would be easy to get the math and we're good. But it's actually much harder than that. So I'll stop here in the interest of time. Th um, thanks to Bruce for this great uh, presentation. I will uh, ask Bruce to stay on just five minutes for maybe a couple of questions. I, okay. I see a few students that may have uh, some uh, new input, and then we can start with the panel. Hi, Rufo. If I may, uh, a very Please. quick question. In Europe, we conduct uh, field research uh, related to privacy, so how people uh, uh, trust uh, various entities uh, with respect to how they treat uh, sensitive data. And it turns out, in fact, that in uh, Europe, uh, people, uh, the entities that the people trust most are governments. So what would you say about the uh, U.S. situation in U.S. in this respect? So there's, there's similar surveys in the U.S. Uh, it tends to split. I mean, just I mean, the, the, the Snowden disclosures are a big deal for us, but in 
in the rest of the world, in the rest of the country, they've kind of gone away. And uh, there is widespread mistrust of government in the US, but more in general, because it's a pretty dysfunctional system right now. And it often depends on whether your guy's in power or not, rather than the actual issues. I mean, there's a, there's a difference between the perception of trust and the reality of, of trustworthiness. A and we know that companies, governments, individuals can manipulate trust perception through marketing. I mean, you know, through, through right advertising, there are trusted brands, not because they are actually more trustworthy, because they are more trusted. Uh, I, I think we are seeing throughout the world broad mistrust in US surveillance which is interesting. There's some fantastic studies around the world. Uh, in the United States, there is broad mistrust of companies. There is a historical difference in US and Europe. In Europe, uh, there tends to be more trust to government, less trust to companies. In the US, the other way. Less trust to government, more trust to companies. That's a gross generalization. But that does seem to be a, a robust uh, result. You know, to me, both work hand in hand. I mean, that quote of mine, that, that, that surveillance is abysmal of the internet, is, is very true. But remember that most government surveillance backs piggybacks on that corporate surveillance. It's not like the NSA woke up in the morning and said, let's spy on everybody. Woke up in the morning and said, these companies are spying on everybody. Let's get ourselves a copy. Right? So I, I think we really have to look at them hand in hand, not government versus corporations, but both. Because they really do enable each other in, in some very deep ways. They're the little bits of, of fighting notwithstanding. Right, the, uh, Microsoft fighting government on data in, in Ireland, or Yahoo fighting the US. I mean, there are exceptions, but by and large, there's a lot of cooperation. I saw a hand. So I've been pushing liabilities for a decade and a half. I think this is a, liabilities is one of our very powerful oversight mechanisms. Because what it says is that we as a government don't know how to figure this out. But so we're going to let things happen. And then private actions will enforce these standards. And again, you have, you have deter, deterrence effect. Right? If, which didn't happen in the US. If the bankers went to jail, all of them, for, for issuing these fraudulent loans, then the next generation of bankers would say, well, let's not issue those fraudulent loans because jail sucks. Right? They would say that. So liabilities are very powerful. And, and we use them to good effect in, in product safety in the United States. And I, and I think having them in, in cyber is, is really valuable. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. I mean, think of Ashley Madison. I mean, they were, they were arguably criminally negligent in how they secured very sensitive data. But because the company is basically going to go out of business, I mean, there's not going to be much in the way of recompense. So you also need government and standards. You can't just have one or the other. But I think liabilities are, are a really big, important part here and something we should really think about. So in the US, it's hard because companies don't want liabilities. And in the US, companies, you know, to a lot of extent, own government. It's hard because getting government to do anything smart is hard right now. OK, so thanks a lot.